I was just saying to Miguel, this was a talk I could have done with a few months ago. We had a big project at uh, work and we had to try and retrofit a whole load of asynchronous stuff. So I really could have done with this talk a while back. Um, Miguel's also responsible for getting me into Flask indirectly because he wrote a very good book on the subject. Um, oh, and he's just fiddling around now with cables. All good? Yeah, I, <laughs> let me check my battery. Yeah, oh, 79. You okay, got yeah, plenty yeah, no, of time. I'm good, I'm good. Right, cool. Um, Miguel's mean, not sure if he's gonna fit the entire of his talk into 25 minutes, so we probably won't have time for questions at the end, but I'm sure he'll be available throughout the conference to go and discuss things. Anyway, big round of applause for Miguel. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, so, so, so yeah, we, uh, we are going to talk about using Flask asynchronously. Uh, so uh, for those of you that don't know me, uh, just, just do not risk running out of time. I don't have an about me uh, slide that will tell you how amazing and incredible I am. So if, <laughs> if you don't know me, uh, a good place to start would be to go to my blog, uh, which you can see the, the URL there. And, and, and then you, you, you know a lot of things about me and uh, what I do. So I'm going to get started. And uh, you know, from, from the basics, uh, I'm sure you hear that async servers are great. Uh, you also hear the term async I.O. You may not know the difference. So uh, what async is, is uh, basically a way to do Concurrency, which means uh, doing multiple things at the same time. So this is uh, this is one of the ways to uh, to do this uh, in Python and in, in many other uh, languages and technologies. Um, uh, it's not the only way, and there are another two ways of doing concurrency that are more used than async, uh, which is using uh, processes and using threads. And I'm sure you you heard about those. Uh, so, so basically, these are the three uh, ways, basically the three options that you have. Um, so async.io is a library that implements the async uh, method of concur concurrency in Python. Uh, and it's based on coroutines, which is a feature of Python that existed for, for ages. So, so uh, async.io makes uh, very good use of, uh, of coroutines to implement the async uh, pattern. Uh, but uh, there are more libraries that uh, implement async in different ways. Uh, and I have a few examples that there are many more than this. But uh, Twisted is another one that it's in many ways is similar to async IO. And it's also based on coroutines. Uh, and then uh, as an example of something that is not based on coroutines, uh, there are two uh, that are based on this other thing called greenlets that I'm going to talk about a little bit uh, during this talk, if, in, in case you haven't heard uh, about that. Uh, and uh, these two frameworks are gevent and eventlet. Uh, so this is a comparison between these three methods, processes, threads, and async. Uh, on, on uh, four different categories that I think are important. Uh, basically, you, you, you can imagine that the idea of running multiple things at once, when you have, uh, for example, one CPU, uh, it, it's based on moving the CPU between different things, right? So, so when, when one task uh, reaches a point where it needs to wait for something, like, for example, reading data from the network, uh, or many other things. Uh, basically, the idea is to put the CPU to do work in another task. And then when the first task is ready to continue, then the CPU comes back. And, and that's basically the idea that all these, you know, these three methods implement in different ways. Uh, for processes and threads, the, the way we move the CPU between different tasks is uh, done by the operating system. So, so Python doesn't play a part in this. Uh, so Python uh, runs the processes or the threads, and then your OS uh, moves the CPU uh, between the different uh, tasks that are ongoing. Uh, and, and the difference in async is that uh, for async, it's done uh, in Python. So Python logic 
in the library that you use, be it AsyncIO or one of the other ones, uh, will be doing this uh, switching between different tasks that are uh, concurrently running. Uh, you're going to be calling functions that, uh, we, we call them blocking functions. These are the functions that basically free up the CPU to go, go do something else, while the, the, this thing that you're doing needs to happen outside of the CPU, like, for example, I.O. That's the most uh, common example. Uh, when you're using Python uh, with processes or threads, uh, since the operating system is taking care of the context switches, uh, you don't have to worry about anything. You can use any functions that read or write or wait or do whatever, and the operating system is smart enough to figure how to uh, distribute the CPU uh, among all the running tasks. Uh, when you're doing it in Python, uh, if you call a function that blocks, Unfortunately, that blocks, uh, what are you doing it uh, with an async library, I mean, uh, that, that blocks everything. So you cannot use many of the functions that are in the Python standard library uh, when you're using uh, any, uh, any of the async library options. Uh, so uh, another important thing is if, if you have not one but multiple cores or, or CPUs is that you would like to use all of them. And uh, when you're using processes, this is not a problem. Uh, if, if you have uh, like a, a four-core server, you can, you can run uh, four instances of your application, and then each will go to one of the CPUs, and they're all going to happily run uh, at the same time. Uh, with threads, in theory, it is the same. Uh, but uh, this is specific to Python. Uh, in Python, we have this uh, beloved uh, GIL, or global interpreter lock. And that sort of prevents a little bit that concurrency with threads. Uh, and I, I don't have time to go into why, but uh, there's a good reason for it. Uh, and, uh, but unfortunately, in terms of concurrency, threads are not so great in Python. Uh, when, uh, when you're talking about async, uh, the, the big problem is that async uh, is it, all done in Python. So, so uh, async applications are usually running in, in one CPU, and th there's no way to use multiple CPUs. Uh, and uh, this is a problem, but in most cases, if you have multiple CPUs, the solution is to combine async with processes. So if you have four cores, then you run four async uh, processes, one on each CPU. And basically that kind of solves the problem. Uh, finally, uh, the differences in scalability is that if, if you need to run many processes, uh, it is expensive. Each process will have uh, a new copy, a different copy of the Python interpreter and you know, all those resources. So you cannot really scale to, to high levels with processes. Uh, threads are a little better. They're, they're a little bit more lightweight than processes. So you, you can get to a few hundred threads in a Python process without much problem. Uh, async, uh, on the other side, are, uh, it, it's very lightweight. The tasks are extremely lightweight. Uh, they exist all within a single Python process, and you can scale it to amazing levels. Uh, so thousands or sometimes tens of thousands in a single Python process. Uh, so if you look at this, uh, the, uh, the only category where async wins is uh, the scalability thing, right? So um, you, you may be wondering why people, you know, why async is so hard and why, why uh, you know, people talk about it so much. And I actually kind of wonder the same thing sometimes uh, because uh, for most, you know, the, the, the applications that you and I build every day, uh, you know, I mean, you, you can do them uh, in async if you like it, but you can probably do them in one of the other two just fine. Uh, unless you have, you know, that massive uh, needs for scalability. So, uh, to summarize, uh, the main reason to use async is when you need to scale to really, really high levels. Uh, so, so this will be for applications that are very busy. You have a lot of clients uh, that are constantly sending requests. Uh, so so you, you, you have a server that's flooded with requests, then, then you do want async because you can scale to, to very high levels. Uh, on the same hardware that you will not be able to with processes or threads. Uh, 
even if you don't have a lot of clients, uh, some applications have requests that run for, uh, for a long time. Uh, and and the, the, the typical examples are long polling and server side uh, events, uh, which basically re uh, require uh, clients to be waiting for the response for a long time. So, uh, so, so in those cases, you also want to have the ability to scale, you know, to cover as many clients as uh, you, you will have uh, online at a, at a given time. Uh, and then finally, the WebSocket is another example of uh, long uh, connections. So, so these are the main cases. And then uh, in recent times, there's one more reason to use async, uh, which is for platforms where that's the only way to do concurrency. Uh, and the, the platform today that, uh, that is in that situation for, for, for many types of hardware is a MicroPython. So uh, MicroPython, is, uh, it, it supports async I.O. And uh, sometimes it's, it's the only way, so it's the way. Um, so I'm sure most of you heard that uh, doing things with async I.O. is, uh, that the reason is, is that it's really fast. And I didn't mention anything about speed, right? So, so where is the misunderstanding here? Uh, so it is not true that async I.O. code runs faster than normal Python code. That's, that's a misunderstanding. Uh, it, it, it's a marketing plot to get you all to use async I.O. Uh, but you should understand <laughs> that that's not, uh, that's not uh, you know, what, what happens. And I'm going to show you, uh, I'm going to try to, uh, you know, to help you understand why you know, people think that it is fast, but uh, it, it isn't really so. So, so here is uh, a comparison uh, between a unnamed framework that's synchronous. This could be Flask, Django, et cetera, and a, an async framework that claims to be super fast, uh, which in, in this example is, let's say, is 100% uh, you know, uh, faster, which means that it can handle, in theory, uh, twice as many requests per second, or that for a given request, it runs for half the time, and it, it completes the request. You can see it either way uh, you want. Uh, but, you know, it, it looks pretty amazing, and you're tempted to use the async framework, right? It's way faster. But uh, let's, let's do this in the context of a real application. So uh, in your server, there's going to be some fixed latencies uh, based on uh, requests arriving, arriving into the server, being, uh, being read, uh, for example, by your load balancer. Uh, there might be latencies in the kernel, the operating system. And those are going to be fixed, regardless of what you use, right? Because uh, you know, this happens way uh, you know, before the request hits uh, the Python process. Uh, if you're doing this for real, you're also going to have uh, uh, encryption, right? You're going to have uh, your server is going to be uh, running on SSL, so there's going to be encryption and decryption, and uh, we, we tend to forget, but that takes time too. And usually, uh, you will do you will be doing this outside of the Python process for performance, which means that it it also take the same amount of time regardless of what framework you use. Now, the most important piece is that you are going to have your own application, right? You're going to write your application. This is going to be where most of the time is spent. Uh, your application, since Python runs at exactly the same speed, uh, whether you use async I.O. or not, then your application more or less is going to run at the same speed. So I'm going to remove now you know, the, the, uh, the different stages. And now, if, if you're looking at the times when, uh, when you have a framework that is twice as fast versus a framework that's, you know, not, uh, you know, it, it's not really a huge difference, right? Uh, so, so really optimizing the web framework is not really, I mean, it's a solution in look of a problem because th there are a lot, a lot of other things that are slower than the framework. So, my advice would be to think about using the framework that, uh, that, that has the biggest community, the, the, the best support, uh, you know, and, and so on, but not look at performance uh, specifically in the framework part. Uh, so this is about Flask. So uh, many of the things that I'm going to say here also apply to the other frameworks, but of course I care about Flask, so I'm going to center it on, on Flask. Uh, 
Uh, so, so we know we can do concurrency in Flask with processes. This is fully supported. Uh, we can do it with threads as well, fully supported. Flask uh, has no problem with this. Uh, the bad news is that the uh, coroutine way of doing async is incompatible with Flask. You cannot use, there's absolutely no way today at least to use Flask with coroutines. That means async IO is out. But uh, this is something that uh, a lot of people don't know. Uh, Flask supports greenlets. Greenlets is this other way of doing uh, concurrency. So, so we have uh, another way to do it with, uh, with Flask. Uh, so if, if you feel like you have to use async IO because you like to use the, the shiny new things, uh, it's absolutely not a problem. And uh, my recommendation in that case, since you cannot use Flask, is uh, uh, the, the two frameworks that, that I know that are pretty good uh, using async IO and they are kind of similar to Flask are Quart uh, and uh, Scenic. Uh, so, so take a look at those. I, I met the author of Quart uh, this morning, so he's here. Uh, so uh, let me show you what's the difference uh, between coroutines R and, and uh, greenlets. So this is uh, an example of uh, a snippet of code using async IO. So you can see from the start that a function that's asynchronous needs to be written specifically uh, to be asynchronous. You have to prepend the function definition with async, which is a, uh, a keyword in recent Pythons. Uh, and then every time you make a blocking call, you have to prepend it with await. And, and this is what uh, basically tells the library that that is a place where the code is going to wait for some sort of event and, and basically indicating to the library that it can take the CPU away and give it to other tasks. Uh, so in this example, I have uh, two, uh, two uh, blocking uh, calls, one to sleep for five seconds. And, and then the other one reads uh, from a socket, reads something from a socket. In, in both cases, the CPU will be sent to some other tasks and, and then return when the condition that generated the wait uh, ends. Uh, note that the sleep function is not the, uh, the same sleep function that you use when, uh, when you work with uh, Python normally, which comes from the time package. The sleep function is a, a, an async IO specific sleep function. And this is, this is an important point. So here you have an example uh, that is basically the same snippet translated into gevent, which is one of the greenlet frameworks. And if you ignore the import line, uh, if you try to find you know, what's different, uh, you're not going to find anything. Because there's actually the same code that you will normally write uh, the only difference is that the, the sleep function will be, you know, the, the function that we, you import from the time package. And here we're using a different one. Uh, and like the case of async IO, all the primitives uh, need to be specifically designed to be async. But unlike async IO, when you work with a greenlit framework, you don't have to uh, code your application in a different way. The, uh, the switching between different tasks happens implicitly and is managed inside the asynchronous functions. So in, the, in this case, it will be sleep. The sleep function that comes with gevent uh, knows how to do the, the context switching. And then the, the receive function from the socket, which will be a uh, gevent uh, socket class, will also know how to do it. So, uh, so you don't have to uh, basically change anything. You can use all the knowledge that you have for standard Python on, uh, on this. Uh, these are the, um, the start dates for all these async frameworks. And uh, you can see that uh, async IO is actually the baby in the async family here. Uh, all the others have been around for, for ages. Uh, and uh, they, are, they are super stable, super robust. Uh, and, uh, you know, they're. they're uh, Maintained and, and Flask supports uh, supports specifically Gevent and Evanlet, uh, and had supported them from uh, from a long time. So, um, when you need to deploy your let's say you want to deploy your your Flask application on an asynchronous web server, uh, you have actually not one but many options. Uh, 
the, the GFN framework comes with its own WSGI compatible server you can use. Uh, Evanlet also comes with its own WSGI server. Uh, if you uh, like GUnicorn, uh, GUnicorn by default is a synchronous server, but uh, it, it supports this uh, plugin architecture for different types of workers, and the, uh, the uh, distribution of GUnicorn, the official uh, GUnicorn comes with workers for both uh, GEvent and event, event LED. So uh, you, you, you can switch, if, if you're using uh, GUnicorn, you can switch to uh, one of these two workers and your application is async. Uh, UWSGI, which is the other major web server, uh, supports uh, optionally using GEvent also as a web server. Um, and then uh, th there's a standalone web server called Mainheld that, uh, that uses greenlets. It, it's not based on uh, GEvent or Eventlet. It implements sort of its own mini async framework, uh, but uh, works in, in many ways in the same, uh, the, the same style as uh, the, the other greenlet frameworks. Um, the, uh, the fact that uh, all these uh, asynchronous functions provided by the greenlit framework's, uh, the, the, the fact that they are, uh, that they look the same, that the original functions in Python uh, allows these frameworks to, uh, what they call it, monkey patching. Uh, they provide a way to replace the functions in the Python library with the async friendly functions. And that means that you don't have to change your code. And it, it can run immediately without changes on the async uh, web server. So here's an example. The, uh, the before line is how you would deploy your server with, say, four workers uh, using synchronous, uh, a, a synchronous uh, option. And then the, uh, the, the only thing you need to do to switch to GUnicorn uh, asynchronously is to go back to one worker and then to set the, the worker type to GEvent or EventLet. Uh, and then uh, this will be an example for, for a server with one CPU. If you have a server with, uh, with four CPUs, then you, you, you could keep the, uh, the workers set to four. You, you will set one per CPU. And that's all it takes. Uh, when you run GUnicorn in this way, it automatically monkey patches the standard library. So if you import, uh, for example, if you import the sleep function from the time package, uh, you, you don't have to change that import, but you will still be getting the sleep function from GEvent or EventLet. Uh, the monkey patching hap uh, happens uh, when, uh, when the process starts. Uh, so I, basically, to, to show you what, what, what this all means, uh, I, I took a, uh, a server, you know, entry point server. This is a 10 USD uh, a month uh, Linode server. So, so one, one CPU and two gigabytes of RAM. And then I installed the application from my Flask Mega Tutorial on it. And then I, I took some measurements of how, uh, how long requests run for. Uh, so I started on, on, the, uh, on the blue line, which is one worker synchronous. And that gave me about four requests per second. So, so really, really bad. Uh, so, so then I upped the number of workers still on a synchronous uh, uh, solution to, uh, to four, and it gave me like 15. So it kind of multiplied almost by four. So it's so basically li li linearly growing with the number of workers. Uh, and then went to 25 workers, and that's the yellow line. And that went to uh, about, I don't know, maybe 70, 75 requests per second. Uh, which is good, but you know, if, if you look at th th those two uh, bar graphs uh, in the top left, uh, you can see the, the yellow bar on the, on the second set of bars, that's memory usage. I, I was getting dangerously, dangerously close to 75% uh, memory, which you know, basically tells me that I cannot scale any more than that uh, because I risk running out of memory. Uh, so the green, the green line is one worker with GEvent. And you can see that you know, by, just by switching the, the GUnicorn start to that, uh, I've got into, what, about 140 requests per second. So, so almost twice as running 25 
synchronous processes with one, uh, one, uh, one G event. And this is, by the way, all these examples, they all go through the entire system. So they do end-to-end. -end. They, uh, they get through NGINX, which is load balancing, and uh, terminating the SSL connection. So, so there's everything in this. So I, I'm, I'm trying not to, uh, to fool you into thinking that this is super fast. I'm, 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 I'm including everything here, which will be the case for, for a real use. Uh, and, and then, just, just as, as, as an experiment, I decided to also run the test on the G-Event uh, setup, but bypassing Nginx and SSL. And uh, in, in case you were thinking that you know, the time it takes to do that is negligible, it's not, because I, I, I've got almost double the amount of requests per second. Uh, so so this, this will apply if you have your load balancer outside of the server, right? If, if you have it in a separate server, then, then you will get a lot more requests per second handled in your server. And uh, we got to, uh, what, almost uh, 250, 240 or so. So uh, you can see, uh, that I, I, I'm almost running out of time. So the, the one note I want to make is, if you look at the bars for the CPU, which are, are the left group of bars in the top left, uh, you can see how efficient G-Event, which is the green bar, is. So when, uh, when we're running you know, a flood of requests, uh, it maximizes the CPU. The CPU is always busy. It always gets something to do. And that's the reason why it gets so many uh, requests throughput through the system, because it always finds uh, something to do. Whereas in the other solutions uh, with, uh, with sync uh, workers, uh, many times the CPU is, is idle because, you know, because of the, the scalability, uh, it, it doesn't get to, uh, to basically uh, maximizing the CPU use. So I made it, uh, and I ran out of time. So I'm not sure if we have time for questions. I think we're out of time for questions. Yes. But, so uh... find me if you have questions. Uh, I'll be here all day. Uh, so I, I have this deployed. So if you want to see this, uh, this benchmark running, I, I can show you. Cool, thank you thank very you. much. A big round of applause, everyone.